This video was sponsored by Skillshare, an online learning community for creators with over 30,000 classes on pretty much anything you'd want to get better at. It's curated specifically for learning, meaning there's no ads and they're always launching new premium classes so you can stay focused on wherever your creativity takes you. I personally messed around with it for the promo they gave me and they had a great course by this DJ named King Author on audio mixing and mastering, which had some indispensable tips on there on how to punch up the depth of your sound. As well, if you're looking for help on writing songs, there's courses on that too. In fact, I was pleasantly surprised to see the incredible indie artist and friend of the Going Off podcast Samus has a hip-hop writing course on there. It focuses on the intricacies of how to structure a rap verse. From word placement in the writing process to your cadence in the booth, she lays out extremely helpful fundamentals for anyone trying to enhance their skills as a wordsmith. So yeah, if you're down for that, the first thousand people to click the link in the description will get a free trial of Skillshare Premium. Plus, it's less than $10 a month with an annual subscription, so if that interests you, check out the link in the description. Hi guys, Rap Critic here, and this was a request by Benjamin Gale. And if you want to support the show and see all the other stuff I'm up to, check out the links in the link tree below. So, as for the request, let's talk about Hobson. Ah yes, the scrappy indie rapper that I championed in my early best of episodes. Dude was a fun shot of manic energy from the jump who made his bones on insult comedy rap, with early buzz coming from singles where he joke on modern mainstream rappers. He was like a young Eminem for a new generation, taking devious shots at the top hip hop radio station targets. On the other hand, he also took some shots that, admittedly, I couldn't help but feel were unnecessary misfires. All you niggas is faker than Lupe Fiasco claiming he skateboards. Yeah, right, that nigga can't even I. I mean, going after Lupe with such a baseless, inconsequential take, I can tell you're clearly just grasping for something snippy and incendiary to say about him. And even if he couldn't, like, oh, yeah, of all people who have a hold in the mainstream, Lupe Fiasco is the one who needs to be taken to task for, what, making a song about the life of a skater while not being enough of a skater himself? Like, what? Who fucking cares? And it's the try-hard stuff like that that gives the game away that you're clearly offending for the sake of offending, which takes the wind out of the sail on some of his songs. Like sure it was entertaining when Eminem dissed Limp Biscuit and the Backstreet Boys and all those guys of the day, but you still believe he thought they sucked for a real reason. And while it's enjoyable on a visceral level to hear a track that's just taken down the top 40 rappers of the day, it still rings insincere when there's no real bite to what's actually being said. And despite me being able to give him props on his lyricism, I can see how the edgelord aspect of his persona can turn a lot of people off of his music, especially in his ill mind of Hobson videos. Now it's a pretty loosely connected series, I mean one of them's just him making a scooter cart for his camera, but as they go on it becomes more and more about the pressing concerns on his mind at the time. From the more awkward, scuzzy, problematic areas to the more focused, righteously indignant subject matter, which channels visceral delivery to good effect while providing a lot of thought-provoking moments. That being said, thankfully today's eighth installment is the latter, as he tackles the most universally understood subject ever. Just how much record label people suck. Homie, I made you rich, paid your rent, and right. Biting the hand that was feeding you, this shit don't make any sense, nigga, what the fuck? And he jumps out the gate with a great point. Just in general, we hear so many industry horror stories of millionaire record execs fleecing their artists, knowing damn well they wouldn't be raking in that cash if it wasn't directly because of what their music and their name brings to the table. When did we ever ask about the gross? When did we ever ask about the net? You would just hand us money from our shows because you knew we wasn't questioning the checks. Nigga, I trusted you with my life. You up your percentage, so I'm making less. But plenty of them know they can take advantage of young artists who care more about getting their music out there than about the particulars of how the money's moving around behind the scenes. We just don't even know. We go with the flow while you rowing the boat. Cause you know when our only concern is just hoping we blow. You send me your joy in this horror. Shit in hotels, no sleep, with no food to order. Meet and greets every single day is torture. How you expecting the A1 performer? I done had it enough, it's enough, bro. Plus I needed something to get my buzz up. And you know, come to think about it, why would you feel comfortable ripping Hobson off? Like, you're the manager of the dude who's infamous for airing out his life problems as soon and as loud as possible to get people's attention. That's the guy you thought was just gonna take that laying down? You know, you think of all industries, hip-hop record companies would be better about not exploiting their artists. The genre's pretty much known for diss tracks by now. You cheat them over for cash, and they've got the resources to call you out in a very public way. And whereas my problem with a lot of diss tracks is that they often just lob general, vague insults and threats without ever going into specifics about why the beef is actually happening, which usually makes me side-eye the rapper's real intentions, that's not a problem here, because he lets you know exactly what issues he has with the person he's dissing. We gave you our trust, and you had us cornered. You got us a shitty label deal with one. He goes in blazing, shooting cannonballs through his former manager's reputation by laying out how he cooked the books to make it so he was getting a bigger slice from all the money Hobson was making for him, exposing Dame's personal vices, which Hobson suspects is why he tried to push them into doing more and more desperate gimmicks. He taking all of my casinos. See, he has a gambling issue. We taste the cash and blood at all like casinos. Damn. You tarnished the brand and you started the front volume fitness. Got us portraying something we really ain't. How we supposed to be ill when you on our website with a shake weight? 
trying to be Billy Blake. Nigga, thanks. He then compares them to the shitty deal with Ruthless Records, the legendary record company behind NWA that infamously dissolved due to fallout over shady business practices. But you don't understand the culture of hip hop. You a lame ass nigga, dang, half the crew knows. New way, Jerry Hella, a scary fella. A reference that actually hits a little closer to home for Hobson, seeing as Hobson actually got his start on the Ruthless Record label when Easy E's wife took over after he died. Our whole label came out with a weak result. You on that same bullshit to nigga, bro. A deal that also ended up dissolving due to fallout over shady business practices. Jeez, I, how many sinking ships does a man have to jump from? But yeah, the video then ends with a long shot of him superimposed with all the pictures of him with his friends on tour, as it looks as if he's melding but never fully fading into the montage of pictures, serving as a visual representation of how those moments are deeply meaningful to who he is, while at the same time playing a speech that's all about moving on from the past. The change is inevitable. One reason we don't like change is we get comfortable where we are. If you're going to be successful, you have to be willing to change. We should constantly evaluate our friendships. A speech that's apparently by Joel Olstein, which, uh, isn't that the guy who kept his megachurch closed during a hurricane and made all sorts of excuses why he couldn't open it until he was called out for being a hypocrite on Twitter? I mean, okay. I guess I can see his self-help guru aphorisms being inspirational if that's what you're looking for, but it, I don't know, it, it doesn't seem like the best person to advise you on evolving into a better human being as a prosperity preacher who literally needed to be shamed by social media before you could do the right thing. Hey, yeah, maybe that's just my standards. Overall though, it's still a solid song, I'd give it a 5 out of 5. It's intense, specific, and makes you understand the pain he's going through with a crisp flow and hype beat work. Dude made his point, scorched the earth, and got the fuck out of there. But hey, maybe this whole episode can serve as a lesson. If you're a millionaire business owner and yet somehow that company's model can't afford to pay its workers a fair living wage, maybe that company's model doesn't need to fucking exist anymore, McDonald's. I said to the new cameraman from Scotland who just asked me what today's lesson was. Yeah, that was <clears throat> that was the full context of what I, what I was talking about there. Just in case any litigation-heavy corporate lawyers wanted absolute clarity on what that sentence was. Well, that's the episode. Leave a like if you like because it helps, comment if you have something to say because it helps even more, and hit the subscribe button and the bell because it helps the most. And if you want to get my merch, follow me on social media, listen to my podcast, or support the show, all those links are in the link tree below. So check all that fun stuff out, and I'll catch you next time. Peace.